the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Who doesn't know this icon of Northwestern Europe? The Dutch are famous for many things, such as their people, their infamous language, and their oranges. No, no, not those oranges. Yes, yes, the House of Orange, which have ruled Holland since 1581. This list will discuss my personal ranking of the Dutch rulers, from Willem the Silent up until Queen Juliana. I won't rank Queen Beatrix or King Willem Alexander, as they are both still living and are two reasons to give a fair and comprehensive ranking. Now before I begin, I would like to reiterate that this is my opinion, but if you disagree, feel free to let me know in the comments and share your own ranking. Now, on with the video. Lodovic II succeeded his father as King of Holland, while his uncle Napoleon Bonaparte was invading the country for reasons I will explain later. He only ruled for nine days at the age of five, which is why he is exempt from the list. Willem V's reign saw the decline of Dutch prestige on the world stage. His rule is marked by numerous scandals such as the Brest Affair, as in Brest, France, don't get any funny ideas, which highlighted the incompetence of the Dutch Navy and wasn't a good look for Willem V. Riots broke out all over the country and when the Queen Consort was insulted when she was temporarily detained by the Dutch people, her brother King Friedrich Wilhelm II of Prussia promptly invaded the country to settle the riots. Willem had to face off the First French Republic in the 1790s, but was decisively defeated and overthrown by the French in 1795, becoming the final stadtholder of the Dutch Republic. Subsequently, the Dutch lost their beneficial colonies of modern-day South Africa and Sri Lanka. Holland officially recognised the United States of America during his reign, but he supported the British side, as his first cousin was King George III after all. While there may be an argument made for a defence for the 18th century monarchs such as Louis XVI of France, I believe there no such defence could be drawn up for Willem V. In my opinion, utter rubbish. Willem II had a short rule of only three years but did oversee the Peace of Munster in 1648, which finally ended the Eighty Years' War, thanks to his father's efforts. Willem stood alone in opposing the peace treaty, as it did not recognise the Southern Netherlands as part of the Dutch Republic. This led to Willem trying to lead his own secret negotiations with the French to try and centralise his powers as Stadtholder, but he died of smallpox in 1650 before he could do this. Ironically, since his son wasn't born yet, the country was left with no stadtholder until 1672, the complete opposite of the centralised position of stadtholder Willem had envisaged. In short, he was useless in my opinion. King Willem I was the first official monarch of the newly termed United Kingdom of the Netherlands. With the defeat of Napoleon, the kingdom now contained the regions of Flanders, Wallonia and the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, making King Willem I also the Grand Duke of Luxembourg. The beginning of his reign was positive, as he accepted a new constitution, Dutch trade began to recover after the wars and the industry was thriving. Willem wanted to unite the Dutch Protestant churches, but ended up becoming resented by his people for this move. Further resentment ended up in the Belgian Revolution of 1830, which was a major embarrassment for the king. He would not recognise Belgium for another eight years, as he wasted much of the country's money in order to reclaim the country, and ruined the economy in doing so. Thanks to this failure, in addition with the passing of a new constitution that he didn't like, and his intentions to marry a Catholic Belgian woman prompted his abdication in 1840. I say good riddance. I am going to get absolutely hammered in the comments for this ranking. The founding father of the Netherlands himself. The Dutch national anthem is about him for crying out loud. 
Prior to becoming the Stadtholder, Willem the Silent had led a rebellion which began the Eighty Years' War against the Spanish Crown and formally deposed King Felipe II of Spain and made himself the Stadtholder. However, despite being the founding father of the country, I don't really see his role as Stadtholder as a success. Willem criticised Spain for persecuting the Dutch Protestants, yet he himself oversaw the persecution of Dutch Catholics. He attempted to make François the Duke of Anjou and brother of the King of France, the new sovereign of the Netherlands. François was extremely unpopular with the Dutch and so he tried to take the country by force but promptly failed, resulting in a cowardly retreat from the country. Despite all this, Willem still supported the Duke of Anjou after his retreat. Thanks to his opinions on the Duke, Willem became politically isolated and unpopular with the people, resulting in his assassination in 1584 becoming the first head of state in world history to be assassinated by a firearm. Ouch. Overall, his involvement in the Dutch Revolt saved him from being ranked any lower. Despite being a rather compassionate person, Juliana's reign was marked by a long list of scandals, the first of which was when her daughter, Princess Irene, secretly became a Catholic and married Prince Carlos Hugo, the Duke of Parma, who was the claimant to the Spanish throne. This did not sit well with the Dutch considering Holland's history with the Catholic Spaniards. This scandal almost resulted in Juliana's abdication, but this was narrowly avoided. Then, the heir to the throne, Princess Beatrix, married a former member of the Nazi Wehrmacht, which resulted in anti-monarchy demonstrations. These also died down after a while. She also faced criticism for inviting a ufologist to have a private audience with the Queen to discuss UFOs. Apart from these scandals, her reign saw the beginning of decolonization in Indonesia and in Suriname. It also saw the birth of the first male heir to the Dutch throne since King Willem III. In the end, she followed her mother's example and abdicated in favour of Beatrix in 1980. I believe she was a well-intentioned monarch who faced intense scrutiny from the world. Willem III was the first Dutch monarch to reign entirely as a constitutional monarch. The problem was he didn't like how limited his powers were as king thanks to his short tempered and violent nature. Upon his father's death in 1849 he contemplated not even accepting the throne of Holland and nearly after a decade on the throne he seriously considered abdicating. Despite this he remained king and had to grant Luxembourg a reactionary constitution which would end the union between the two countries and make Luxembourg a new country with Willem as Grand Duke. However, in 1867, Napoleon III of France offered to purchase Luxembourg from Willem III, but Otto von Bismarck of Prussia objected to this. The crisis almost led to war between France and Prussia, but was avoided with the Treaty of London. Upon his wife's death in 1877, Willem caused uproar with his choice of women he wished to marry, which included Elizabeth Sibyl of Saxe Weimar Eisenach, Toda of Denmark, and Emilie Ambre, a French actress. Willem settled for Emma of Valdeck and Piermont, and their happy marriage contributed to the king's best decade of his reign, that being the last decade. I believe that despite his struggles against his constitutional restraints, he eventually grew used to his role as he grew older. To my surprise, I'm not putting him at the bottom of the list. Willem IV ruled for four years and died of a stroke. That's it, to be honest. That's his reign summed up considering he did nothing of note during his reign. He became Stadtholder in 1747 as a reaction to the disunity of the Dutch government without a Stadtholder and because of their country's position in the War of the Austrian Succession. Willem was initially liked but ended up becoming friends with the businessmen of the Dutch East India Company while the divide between the rich and the poor grew in his country. In my humble opinion, he was the definition of mediocre. <laughs> 
Willem II may have had the same conservative views as his father, but when the time was right, he was more than willing to concede to more liberal demands. In 1848, revolutions had broken out all across Europe due to European monarchs refusal to grant liberal constitutions. Seeing the violent pattern spread throughout Europe, Willem decided to propose a liberal constitution before the Dutch people proposed their own, less favourable version to the king. This clever move transitioned the Dutch monarchy into a period of constitutional monarchy, which still exists today thanks to Willem II. Sadly, the king died suddenly in 1849, at the age of 56, after a reign of only 8 years, meaning I can't put him any higher on this list. Lodovic I, I call him Louis for simplicity's sake, was intended to be a puppet king of Holland under his older brother's rule. Said brother was Napoleon Bonaparte. However, in contrast to Napoleon, Louis wanted to adopt his new kingdom's cultures and language. He became extremely popular in his efforts to speak the Dutch language and in personally helping the relief efforts during the light and gunpowder disaster of 1807 and the Dutch floods of 1809. When he began to be called Louis the Good, Napoleon became annoyed with his younger brother and told him that his nickname was, was a sign that he was a failure of a king. So when Napoleon ordered Louis to send troops to Russia for the infamous invasion, Louis straight up refused. Subsequently, Napoleon removed all the French troops from Holland, leaving the country undefended and open to attack from the British, which is what happened. While this invasion failed, Napoleon himself had become fed up of Louis' rule and invaded Holland outright forcing Louis to abdicate. Personally, I think he's a solid king. <laughs> Willem III, better known as William of Orange, is considered to be the Protestant saviour of England and the Netherlands but is considered to be no better than Satan by the Irish, Scottish and the rest of Catholic Europe. Following a long period without a stadtholder at the helm, the Netherlands had been invaded by both the French and the English. This caused the Dutch people to panic and to overthrow then lynch their Prime Minister, Johan de Witt. And yes, this is that time the Dutch ate the Prime Minister. There have been rumours of Willem being involved but they've never been proven. Following this, Willem was restored to the position of Stadtholder and provided the centralised leadership that was absent for the past 22 years. He defeated the English under his uncle, Charles II, in the Third Anglo-Dutch War, but lost to the French in the Franco-Dutch War under Louis XIV. By the end of the 1680s, his uncle, the Catholic King James II of England, had been deposed and Willem and his wife were invited to become King and Queen of England, Scotland and Ireland in what became known as the Glorious Revolution. The English considered this as a peaceful coup d'etat, whereas the Dutch considered it as a Dutch conquest, similar to that of the Norman conquest, however I believe it resembled more of the former. In total, he was a solid stadtholder, but his massacres of the Irish and Scottish prevent him from gaining the top spot. Having inherited the position of Stadtholder at the age of 16 and with the Dutch revolt beginning to fail, Mauritz's future looked very bleak indeed. However, Mauritz wasn't going to give up without a fight. He reorganised the Dutch army and completely turned the tide of the revolt in their favour, pushing back the Spanish forces in the 1590s. Thanks to this, Mauritz not only saved the Dutch Republic from falling back into Spanish hands, but he also became one of the most renowned military leaders of his time. It was during his rule that the Dutch East India Company was founded, which would cement the Dutch on the world stage in the future, and also begin the first Dutch colonies in New Amsterdam, modern day New York. It was also during his reign that the Dutch gained the reputation for being a very wealthy country. Towards the end of his reign, Mauritz had his chief minister executed because he signed a 12 year truce with Spain against Mauritz's orders. Following this, he then pretty much ruled as an absolute ruler from 1618 up until his death in 1625. He also encouraged his half-brother, Frederick Hendrik, to get married to preserve the Orange dynasty, hinting that the Netherlands may become a kingdom in the future. 
Despite this, I believe he was a great ruler. World War Queen of the Netherlands, Wilhelmina deserves to be referred to as the People's Queen as she truly held an admiration for the Dutch people. She was an outspoken queen who openly criticised the Dutch politicians of her time. The Boer War broke out during the first decade of her reign and she openly criticised the British for their war efforts as she sided with the Boer people of South Africa. Wilhelmina suffered a series of miscarriages which put the future of the country at risk as Heinrich the 32nd Royce of Kustritz was effectively next in line to the Dutch throne and it threatened to drag Holland into the German sphere of influence. These worries were quelled with the birth of a daughter, Juliana, in 1909. Her position of neutrality during World War I helped prevent the country from being invaded and following the war, she granted asylum to Kaiser Wilhelm II despite having personal disagreements with him. She also used her family's wealth to make investments in the United States, which enriched the country and helped not only the economy to improve, but made Wilhelmina the first female billionaire in dollars. Holland was invaded by Germany in 1940 and the Queen was evacuated to Britain where she led the exiled government and became a symbol of Dutch resistance. After the war, Wilhelmina's health began to decline and she was the target of criticism by the Indonesians during the revolution against the Dutch. This led to Wilhelmina's abdication after 58 years on the throne. In short, she was such an effective monarch that she became the embodiment of the Dutch spirit of the 20th century. An absolute legend in my opinion. Frederick Hendrik is often overshadowed by his older half-brother, Mauritz, but I believe he was Mauritz, but better. He was as capable of a general as his brother, but he had the political skills that Mauritz did not. He really did need these skills as Europe had been plunged headfirst into the bloody Thirty Years' War. His rule is often described as a golden age for the Republic, as he furthered the advances against the Spanish, both on land and in the sea, and his reign also oversaw a golden age in the arts and in the Netherlands. Even though he was a brilliant military general, Frederick Hendrik realised the potential in Dutch trading and focused the country's efforts in trade which would become a big reason why Holland remained such an important country for the next few centuries. He also benefited from the weakness of the Spanish during the Portuguese War of Independence by invading the Brazilian colonies and claiming them for themselves for the next few decades. By the end of his reign, he had effectively achieved the main goals of the Eighty Years' War, but didn't leave to see the war officially end. In my opinion, an outstanding ruler who deserves much more credit than other Dutch rulers. Wow, that list did not turn out as I expected whatsoever. I wasn't expecting King Willem III to be above Willem the Silent himself. I also didn't expect the top spot to go to Frederick Hendrik, considering he is less well known as Berto's counterparts. Lodovic I also turned out to be a fairly competent king, as he didn't let Napoleon order him about a puppet. However, I was a bit disappointed that Willem the Silent ended up being so low on this list, as he is considered the founding father of Holland. It also becomes a bit repetitive when literally half of the Dutch rulers are all called Willem, and they end up repeating their regular numbers after the Napoleonic Wars. Nonetheless, please share your opinions in the comments below and any ideas for future videos. Until next time, Tortsians!